Let's discuss how to identify and distinguish between substances. So substances can be identified or distinguished in the following five ways. Using melting point, boiling point, solubility, density, or chemical properties. All right, these five properties I just stated are unique to each substance. If you change any of these five properties I just stated, you change what the substance is. So the melting point, boiling point, solubility, density, and chemical properties are all unique to a substance. So let's go over uh, two of these properties, melting point and boiling point. So if you look at Li and Be on table S here, which have atomic numbers here of 3 and 4, as you can see, um, you'll see that the melting points and boiling points differ. Li has uh, 454 Kelvin and Be is 1560 Kelvin as the melting points, meaning that obviously the melting points are different, right? And furthermore, that shows that Li and Be are different because melting point is a uh, unique uniquely identifying characteristic that's specific to each substance. All right, Li and Be also have different boiling points. Li is 1615 Kelvin and Be is 2744 Kelvin. So they're different substances since boiling point is another identifying characteristic that distinguishes one substance from another, okay? Uh, solubility is yet another property. Uh, sugar, which can be glucose or sucrose, and table salt, which is sodium chloride, will dissolve differently in water. And these differences in how much they dissolve in water actually can be used to tell them apart from each other. All right, the density or mass per unit volume is yet another property um, that can distinguish two substances from another. All right, so let's take the example of Li and Be. So Li has a density on a table S of 0.534 grams per cubic centimeter, while BE has a density of 1.85 grams per cubic centimeter. All right, just like is shown here with LI and BE, substances all will have different densities depending on what they are. So that's what you can use to identify them differently. So just in the case of LI and BE, you can tell that they're different substances because they have different densities. So chemical properties are the next and final um, distinguishing property or feature. Of, uh, that distinguishes two substances from each other. All right, specifically, if you don't change what the substance is, you don't change the chemical properties. But if you do change what the substance is, you do change the chemical properties. So let's see an example of that. For example, 14 grams NaCl and 200 grams of NaCl have the same chemical properties because they're both the same substance, NaCl. The only thing that's different are their masses. But obviously, their chemical properties would be the same um, because they're still the same substance, the compound NaCl. On the other hand, um, table salt and sugar have um, different chemical properties because they're different substances. Table salt, as I just stated, is NaCl or sodium chloride, while sugar is glucose or sucrose. Therefore, they have different chemical properties because they're different substances, obviously, right? So the main idea here is this. If you change a substance's identity, meaning what it is, you will change the chemical properties. But if you don't change the chemical identity, meaning what the substance is, such as with um, 14 grams NaCl and 200 grams NaCl, you don't change the chemical properties, okay? So the main idea here is this. Um, if you change any of these five properties, melting point, boiling point, solubility, density, or chemical properties, you change the chemical identity of the substance, meaning what it is. These five properties are used to identify what the substance is. If all five of these properties are the same, you have the same substance. But if any of these five properties is different, the substance will automatically be different. Now let's discuss how to find uh, melting point. So melting point is the temperature at which the solid and liquid phases exist at the same time. Specifically, the melting point is the temperature at which solid becomes a liquid. All right, and melting point is located uh, in this column that I boxed in red here on table S really easily for elements. Uh, for example, SI, as you can see here, uh, if you look down here, um, has a melting point of 1687 Kelvin. So therefore, SI melts at 1687 Kelvin, meaning solid SI becomes liquid SI. Another example is um, AL. All right. And uh, Al has a melting point of 933 Kelvin, so Al melts at 933 Kelvin, obviously, since that's its melting point, meaning that solid Al becomes liquid Al at 933 Kelvin. So just look at this column uh, on table S, which is right here in your reference tables. Um, 
to find the melting point of an element. That's really easy. Mel finding melting point is very easy. It's on table S and it's in this column, okay? Now let's discuss the definition and calculation of density. Density, as you know, is mass per unit volume. Um, and on table T, the formula for density is density is equal to mass divided by volume or M divided by V. You can look that up on your own on table T, but the formula for density on table T is density is equal to mass divided by, by volume or M divided by V. All right, and as you know, the densities of elements are listed on table S. So those are the two main reference tables you need to use, especially for this slide. Okay, so the units for density um, can either be grams per milliliter or G slash ML, or it can be G slash CM cubed, which is, which is grams per cubic centimeter. Since um, the mass and the density formula, which is M, is uh, measured in grams, and the volume in the density formula, V, is measured in ml, which is milliliters, or cm cubed, which is cubic centimeters. So therefore, the formula is density in grams per milliliter, uh, or grams per cubic centimeter, equals mass in grams divided by the volume in milliliters or cubic centimeters. Okay. Now, when comparing densities to different substances, I want you to remember a very simple phrase, fold domes, which stands for floating objects less dense uh, with F, O, L, and D here making up fold and denser objects more easily sink with D, O, M, E, and S here making up domes. So if something floats, it's less dense than the objects beneath it. On the other hand, if something sinks beneath everything else, it's more dense than the objects above it. So denser objects will obviously... Um, will obviously uh, more easily sink, um, while floating objects are obviously less dense, full domes. Also just note that the densities of elements, again, are listed on table S in this column right here. Okay? Uh, for example, lithium's density is 0.534 grams per cubic centimeter, uh, and boron's density listed here is 2.34 grams per cubic centimeter. Now let's try an example of calculating and comparing densities. So the example reads the density of water is 1.00 grams per milliliter, the mass of a substance is 4.00 grams, and the volume is 5.00 milliliters. Calculate the density and determine what would happen next uh, if the substance is put in water, right? So first, uh, let's calculate density. Density, based on the formula in units in grams per milliliter, equals um, mass in grams divided by volume in uh, milliliters, right? We know here that the mass is 4.00 grams, because grams is the unit for mass, right? And we know that the volume here is 5.00 milliliters, since ml is the unit for uh, volume, right? So mass as 4.00 grams divided by uh, volume as 5.00 milliliters, when you do it on the calculator, gives us a density of 0.80 grams per milliliter, um, for the substance. Now, when determining what happens if a substance is placed in water, we have to compare the densities of the substance and of the water to find out whether the object will sink or float in the water, right? As we can see, the density of water here is 1.00 grams per milliliter, which I've starred here. And the density calculated for the substance is 0 0.80 grams per milliliter, as I've starred here as well, right? Now we use the idea that floating objects are less dense and that denser objects more easily sink or full domes, right? Which I've written here um, to find out what happens. So let's remember the idea that um, floating objects are less dense and denser objects more easily sink from full domes, meaning that less dense objects float and more dense objects sink to the bottom. So as we can see, this object has a calculated density of 0.80 grams per milliliter, and we know that the density of water is 1.00 grams per milliliter from the problem. So let's compare the densities. Um, since this object has a calculated density of 0.80 grams per milliliter, which is less than um, the density of water at 1.00 grams per milliliter, as we can see here, we know that this object obviously would float on water because the object is less dense than water is. Um, it floats on top because obviously less dense objects float according to full domes, right? Um, therefore, um, by the logic of full domes, the floating object would have to be less dense, which is the 0.80 gram per milliliter density object, um, 
while the higher density substance, which is the water with the density of 1.00 grams per milliliter, would sink to the bottom because it's a higher density. All right, so that's the idea here. Obviously, the substance with a density of 0.80 grams per milliliter would float because it's less dense. And as we know, floating objects are less dense according to full domes, okay? So from this slide, remember two important things. First of all, full domes equals full objects less dense and denser objects more easily sink, right? Also remember that um, density uh, is equal to mass divided by volume. It can either be in grams per cubic centimeter or grams per milliliter, depending on what the units of mass and volume are. 1.16 physical and chemical changes. This lesson is due for Thursday, October 9th. Let's move on to the lesson. Let's first talk about something known as a physical change. Now, we learned about physical properties, and we know that physical properties involve properties that do not change um, the composition of the substance. In a similar way, a physical change is a change that does not lead to the formation of a new substance, meaning it's still the same substance, but it just has a slightly different appearance. For example, if you melt something, it's going to look, you know, kind of more spaced out a little bit than a solid would, but it's still going to be the same substance. For example, ice is the same thing as um, water. They're both H2O. They are both water. One is just a solid form for ice and the other looks like a puddle for water. So they're still the same substance but you just have a different appearance because you melted it. So along those lines something like melting or a phase change in general would be a physical change because you're not changing the composition or of the substance or in other words what it is. You are actually still having the same substance but they just have a slightly different appearance. Ripping paper. If you rip paper, you're not changing the fact that it's paper. It's still paper. You're just making it look a little ripped. Dissolving is another example of a physical change because if you, um, if you dissolve salt and water, it's still salt and water. You're not changing the fact that it's salt and water. You're not making it into something new. It's not going to turn blue and all of a sudden turn into, you know, GAC or something like that. It's just salt and water mixed together. So dissolving is, is an example of physical change because you're just rearranging the water and the um, salt particles, um, you know, but you're not changing the fact that they're salt and water. Or um, folding things. That's also an example of physical change because you're not changing the fact that, you know, if you fold paper, you're not changing the fact that it's paper. So the two main examples I want you to focus on are phase changes and dissolving. Are because if you change the state of matter or something, you're not changing the fact that it's that same substance. You're just changing it into a solid liquid or gas. It doesn't change what it is. Dissolving just means you're mixing it physically. So you're not actually changing the composition. You're just, you know, rearranging the particles around. All right, so the key idea I just mentioned um, over the several examples was you're rearranging the particles, but you're not changing what it is. You're only rearranging them, meaning you're only moving them around a little bit. All right, so let's just go into specific examples with uh, phase changes and something like dissolving or just, pr you know, general rearrangement. Um, let's say we have H2O liquid particles, which look like this. All right, and H2O gas particles, let's remember, means that they're more spaced out, but they're not broken apart or reattaching. They're just spaced out differently for gases because gas phase has more space between the particles. All right, so evaporation is a phase change where you go from liquid like this to gas like this. The only thing you're changing is the space in between the particles. Here you have less space, here you have more space. So the particles are just spaced out differently after the phase change, but they're still the same material, aka H2O. So that's why phase change is a physical change because if you look at this particle diagram, they're still both H2O. It's just that one's a liquid and the other's a gas. So phase change would be a physical change because there's still H2O here and H2O here, but they just have different spaces between them. You're just rearranging them because you're making this one more spaced out than this one. All right, so you're kind of just pushing things around in a phase change. Um, so it's a physical change. Another example is rearrangement. Um, let's say you, um, you know, decided to start stirring around um, I don't know, uh, oxygen atoms and, and iron atoms or something like that. Yeah, oxygen for red and iron for green. All right, if you just rearrange them, you're not making them change into something different. You're just kind of moving the green particles around this area so that they look like this in the, end, in the ending result. So the particles are just rearranged, but they still have the same material and composition. They're not reattached or pulled apart or anything. They're just moved around. The green particles are just surrounding the red ones now. So there's a physical change because you're only changing the, um, the position. You're just making it kind of rearrange around, but you're not attaching anything. You're not breaking any, anything apart or pulling anything apart. Same idea here for a phase change. 
um, you're not, um, you're obviously not uh, breaking apart anything. You're just making them space out a little more. So that a phase change would be a physical change, and so would this, just stirring something around. Also, dissolving something in water would just make the water and the particles just kind of, you know, slush around. But they're not changing what they are, like salt and water. All right. So if it's still the same substance, it's physical. So if we had a chemical reaction, so let's pretend that we had an arrow between the H2O and the um, and and H2O liquid and H2O gas. If this were a change, you'll see this a lot in, on the chemistry regions. If this is some kind of change, you'll realize that H2O liquid and H2O gas are the same substance, they're just different phases. So if it's still the same substance, such as an H2O and H2O, it's a physical change because you're only changing the phase. You're not changing the composition, meaning you're not changing the fact that it's H2O. So this is an example of a physical change because you're not changing the fact that it's H2O. All right? On the other hand, with the chemical change, let's see what that means. So let me just actually um, retype something in here just so we can use this for this lesson. All right? So um, a chemical change is a change that does lead to the formation of a new substance, meaning a different substance. Examples include burning and chemical reaction of, of substances. All right, another example is rusting, as you remember. Remember, with burning, if you burn something, it's usually reacting with oxygen and the air to burn. And if you chemically react two substances, you're combining them in a way that changes them to something completely different. So burning, you're reacting something with oxygen, hence making it change into something else. If you um, react two substances, you're combining them in a way, chemically, that makes them change what they are. So the key idea here is you're changing what it is, and you're actually pulling apart and reattaching the particles. Let's remember for physical changes in the previous slide, we we're just kind of, you know, mixing things around, pushing things around, but you, were re you weren't really changing what it was. In this case, however, for chemical changes, you are changing and reattaching particles and stuff like that. All right, so let's see two examples here. Um, let's say you have, um, let's say you have uh, two and two here, and two gas, nitrogen gas, and two gas like this, and you have two units of O2 gas or two units of oxygen um, molecules, O2 here and O2 here. This is N2, and the O2s are separate from the N2. All right, on the other hand, on the right side, you have two NO2s, and notice here what I did was. I broke apart the nitrogens, so they became separate nitrogen atoms, and I broke apart the oxygens here and here, and so these two attached to this one, so it became this, and these two broke apart and attached to this one, so it became like this. So you actually broke this apart, broke this apart, broke this apart, and they reattached to each of the nitrogens so that you made two NO2. By NO2, I mean you have one blue for one nitrogen and two reds for two oxygens. This is why it's NO2 one blue N and two red O's. One blue red and two, N o, uh, two red O's. All right, so look at even the equation. The left side here, N2 plus O2, is different from the right side, which is NO2. It's a chemical change because you're literally breaking this apart here, each of these um, molecules, and you're reattaching them to make something new like this, um, NO2 and NO2. All right, so you're breaking apart and reattaching them. So in summary, N2 plus O2 becoming 2NO2 is a chemical change because the particles turn into something new, so they're not attached the same way. In other words, you pull off and reattach the reds and the blues elsewhere to make something new, namely the NO2s. That's a chemical reaction here. Notice that the left side and the right sides are different. In reactions, in other words, in chemical changes or reactions, left sides and right sides are different. This side, N2 and O2, is completely different from NO2 by itself. All right? Um, I'm actually going to re rewrite this part also just so we can understand what this means. All right? So we have um, two COs here. We have C and O, C, sorry, C and O, C and O. One black for one C and one red for one O. One black for one C and one red for one O. Then we have O2 here as a molecule, all right? One black, one red, one black, one red. So two COs and we have two O2s here, okay? On the left side. And then on the right side, we have two CO2s. So we have one black and two red. One black and two red. But wait, this is completely different from what we saw on the left side. Because notice how I had one black, one red, but now we have, I have one black and two reds. So what I did was I broke this apart and reattached one red here and the other red here so that you could get two CO2s. So what I did essentially was I broke things apart and reattached them away so it changed. All right? 
So in a chemical change, again, I broke apart the oxygen molecule and reattached them to each carbon so that you became two CO2s. So essentially, the particles turn into something new, so they're not attached the same way. You pulled off the reds apart and reattached them to each carbon to make something new. All right, so that's why this is a chemical change. On the particle diagram level, you're breaking something apart and reattaching to make something new. All right, and if you even look at the chemical reaction or the chemical change, the left side 2CO and O2 is not the same thing as 2CO2. There, this is combined in a completely different way from this, so therefore it's a chemical change. All right, so that's how you know. If the left side and the right side are different, like this in terms of the substances, then obviously it's a chemical change. On the other hand, if the left sides and the right sides are the same in terms of their substances, it's a physical change. All right, that's how you can tell the difference. And also the particle diagrams, if you space them out differently or rearrange them, that's a physical change. If you break things apart like this and reattach them to things like this, then it's a chemical change. All right, that's how you know. And let's remember the physical change, um, main examples are phase changes and dissolving, whereas the chemical change, um, main examples are burning and chemical reactions of substances. Now let's just review exothermic and endothermic reactions. We talked about this briefly with the, uh, with the phase changes, but now let's just review. Exothermic reactions mean reactions that release energy as heat. In other words, heat exits the object. The direction of the heat flow is from the systems, which is the inside, to the surroundings, which is the outside. So that's what exothermic means. You go from the inside system to the outside surroundings. And as a result, since you're giving heat to the outside, the surrounding temperature will increase. Examples include burning wood, freezing, condensation, um, deposition, burning, you know, and the hot solution. Uh, and in the case of a hand being burned, the hand gets burned because the object is hotter. The stove, for example, is, um, has all the heat and it releases it to the surroundings, meaning the hand. That's why the hand gets hotter. So it goes from the system to the surroundings. The system, aka the stove, feels hot because it releases heat. All right? So if you're bringing heat to the outside, the outside temperature, meaning the hand here, would increase its temperature. Freezing condensation and deposition, let's remember, are exothermic processes because um, you're releasing heat to make the particles clump closer together. All right, now we have the opposite, endothermic reactions, which are reactions that absorb or suck in energy as heat. So in other words, heat enters the object. All right, so um, the direction of heat flows from the outside surroundings to the inside system like this. All right, so since you're absorbing or entering heat, it goes from the outside surroundings to the inside system. And since the heat is leaving the outside and going inside, the surrounding temperature, the outside temperature will decrease because it's colder on the outside because you've lost all that heat to the inside. All right, so examples include melting, evaporation, sublimation. Let's remember because um, melting, evaporation, and sublimation involve absorbing heat to make the particles go further apart because the potential energy is also increasing. All right, another example is photosynthesis. All right, now let's go back to the melting example. Um, with a melting example, an ice cube will melt in your hand because your hand is hotter. Think of your hand as the surroundings and the, and the ice cube as the system. So the heat goes from the surroundings, your hand, to the system, which is the inside of the ice cube. It's an endothermic reaction because the, it, the heat goes from the surroundings, your hand, which is hotter, to the system, which is the colder object. All right, the system, aka the ice cube, feels cold because it absorbs heat. All right, your hand temperature decreases, and that's why your hand feels colder when you touch an ice cube. The ice cube is melting because it's sucking in all the heat and making the particles move further apart, therefore making it into a liquid. That's all you need to know about um, endothermic reactions. If you absorb heat, the heat goes into the system and the surrounding temperature decreases. For exothermic reactions, the, the reactions release heat or exit heat, so therefore the heat goes to the outside and the surrounding temperature increases. Just remember these three phase changes for exothermic reactions and just remember these three phase changes for endothermic reactions. Melting, evaporation, and sublimation involve absorbing heat to drive the particles further apart in terms of distance. Freezing, condensation, and deposition are exothermic reactions because you're releasing heat to make the particles pack closer together like that. Okay, so there you go.